Dzień dobry, witam wszystkich serdecznie na spotkaniu zorganizowanym przez firmę Audiotech, czyli dystrybutora na Polskę marek takich jak Focusrite Innovation, dzięki którym tutaj dzisiaj się spotykamy i oczywiście dzięki firmie Music Store, w której się obecnie znajdujemy. Mamy dzisiaj gościa specjalnego, którym jest Chris Kalkant. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> Specjalista z firmy Novation Focusrite, który opowiem nam o nowych produktach, między innymi nowym interfejsie od Novation, nowym interfejsie od Focusrite, znanej już wszystkim serii Scarlet Model Solo, nowy interfejs do nagrywania na iPhone'ie, iTrack Pocket i kilka innych rzeczy. Zapraszam wszystkich do wysłuchania Chris'a. Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for coming along. Um, I hope this evening will be interesting to you. Um, the way that we will work the presentation is we will start off by looking at Focusrite products, and then the second section will move into the Novation products. Um, as uh, just uh, mentioned, we have some uh, brand new products with us at the moment, and this is their very first Uh, public demonstration outside of the UK. Um, last weekend we had a big exhibition called the BPM exhibition and we had them there with us there but this is literally the very first time these products have been demonstrated um, outside, of, outside of the UK. So the, we're going to start off by looking at Focusrite um, and we will move into the new products as we Uh, discuss Focusrite, but I think it'd be very interesting to explore who Focusrite are as a company and really how we've got to the position that we're in at the, at the present time producing things like the Scarlet interfaces. And it all really starts off back in 1985. And we have this chap here, this gentleman here, This guy is um, a man called Sir George Martin. Now, Sir George Martin was the producer for um, a very small band from the 60s known as the Beatles. I don't know if you've have you heard of the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sir George Martin was the Beatles producer. Now, in 1985, um, another very well-respected gentleman in the audio industry um, approached George Martin. So this gentleman was called Rupert Neve. Now Rupert Neve is widely understood to be probably one of the finest audio console microphone preamp equalization designers that the world has seen. And Focusrite, started in 1985, was started by Rupert Nee, the man himself. And the very first product that Focusrite built was a commission, a joining between Sir Rupert Nee, sorry, Rupert Nee and Sir George Martin. And this was the product that was designed. This is called the ISA 110 or ISA 110. The ISA marked the very first Focusrite microphone preamp. And ISA, which is still being manufactured today, ISA stands for Input Signal Amplifier. Very straightforward, very easy. So the ISA 110 was what we call a transformer coupled mic pre, and it was, a, it was designed by Rupert Lee. Now this uh, ISA 110 found its way into this studio, which is the Air, um, Air Lindhurst studio in London, a world famous recording studio. And it's difficult to see, but here, the ISA 110s are still in place. So Neve was building high quality microphone preamps to go into world class recording studios. 
alongside the ISA 110, we've also designed, uh, designed with a guy called uh, Trevor Stride, the ISA 130, which was a compressor, a dynamic, uh, a dynamic control effect. And again, these went into the Air Montserrat studios, which was um, the second of Sir George Martin's recording studio. So the next step for Rupert Neve was to build this thing. This is the Focusrite Forte mixing console. Now this was a no expense spared, very expensive, very high-end recording studio console. There were only ever two of these made. One went to Electric Lady Studios in New York, which was the studios that Jimi Hendrix built in 1970-1971. And the second one went to a place called Master Rock Studios in London. This was a no-compromise mixing console. It was the best that money could buy at the time. And the problem with this was it was very difficult to build and very expensive. And in 1989, unfortunately, because of this project, Focusrite had to um, file for bankruptcy, had to stop. So initially, Rupert Neve, this very big name in recording console manufacturing, uh, had taken a microphone preamp design and built it into this world-class studio uh, uh, mixing console, but because of the problems, unfortunately, the company stopped. And then, in 1989, this gentleman comes along. Now, this is Phil Dudridge. This is the current owner and chairman of Focusrite. And Phil is a legend. <laughs> Phil was the sound engineer for Led Zeppelin on the <coughs> first US tour. Uh, Phil also started a company that you may have come across called Soundcraft. Phil was one of the first people, well, himself and another chap, Graham Blythe, started the company Soundcraft. He also has a Harley Davidson motorbike, which is pretty cool, in electric blue. <laughs> so. <laughs> Phil came along and decided he wanted to continue to build recording studio consoles. The next console that was built was this, the Studio Series. And again, this was a no expense spared design, but the way that this was, was designed was a much better proposition for, for studios. Ten of these mixing consoles were built. And you can see on the design here that it was built in different, what we call bucket sections, almost like a modular mixing desk, if you like, which meant that these parts could actually be built in the factory and then brought along to the recording studio to be placed together in the recording studio. So this made it much more economically, um, a, a better economic idea. So, the Studio Series console um, basically cemented itself, or became known as, as again, a world-class recording studio console. And this, uh, last year, or was it this year? I forget now, but we, we've recently become 25 years old, and we've produced this film um, on uh, basically the story of the recording, of the studio recording console. And this film shows the amount of emotional attachment that people have to this equipment. It's a fa if, you, if you have a nice bottle of wine and 35 minutes, it's definitely worth watching. So, we're 25 years old now, and I just want to quickly run through some of the other products that Focusrite have created. So... Famously, we built recording studio consoles, but this was at a time when recording studios were changing. And things were very much moving towards digital recording um, and away from 
traditional recording methods of tape-based recording. And so, as Phil Dudridge, the guy who owns uh, Focus Rights, has said on several occasions, we were the last in to building large-scale consoles, but we were also the first out. So we started late and came out early. Because the times were changing. And then the next thing that came along was the Red Range. And this was one of the first times that you could get microphone preamps, EQs and compressors in rack-mounted form. And it meant that you did not have to buy a full-size recording console, but you could buy the different aspects and build up your own system. The Red Range won several awards, tech awards, um, and if you ever see these in studios today, people still absolutely love these. They're not made anymore, but people emotionally are genuinely very attached to these products. So this is the Red Range, and then over the next few years, things developed <coughs> quite quickly for Focusrite. In 1995, there was the Blue Range of products. The Blue Range are... Uh, well, were designed for mastering engineers. Again, these were not cheap pieces of equipment, they were very highly engineered, but it's expanding into different areas. The next one is, I would say, probably one of the more, most important products Focusrite have created. It was the Green Range. Do you? And what we can see, yeah, this is, <laughs> yeah, do you remember them? Yes. Yeah. Now the thing with the green range is, up until this point, Focusrite had been building professional, high-end, world-class, world-class studio-based equipment. When the green range came along, it started to move into the project studio sector. So the smaller scale uh, recording studios. And then following on from the green range, in 1998, we had the Platinum Range, and this was designed for the home studio. So hopefully you can see now how the company started with Rupert Neve, built big recording consoles, but then as the market and times changed, saw the value in bringing this product into a cheaper price point or more affordable price point to let everybody be able to afford a Focusrite product. Now, the next product that we designed wasn't a Focusrite product. Well, it was, but it wasn't specifically <coughs> Focusrite. It was a collaboration with DigiDesign. And this was the original M-Box. This was the very first audio interface that Focusrite produced. And it, as I say, collaboration with DigiDesign. DigiDesign approached Focusrite and said, we like your preamps, we'd really like you to build us a product that we can, you know, we can work with together. And the M-Box was around. It was very, very popular indeed. It was, uh, became one of the fastest selling audio interfaces of all time. <coughs> um, and was, yeah, incredibly popular. Now, when any sort of collaboration happens like this, one company could say, well, thank you very much for helping us start a project. Now we'll do it ourselves. <laughs> and so the M-Box moved into being an M-Audio-based product. But this was fine because at Focusrite, this meant that we could now start to build our own interfaces as well. And that's exactly what we have here with the Scarlet and the Sapphire range. Now, a couple of other quick things that I'd like to talk about. Now, these products aren't made anymore, but I think these are very important to understand who Focusrite are as a company. And this is the Liquid Channel. Now, the Liquid Channel was a very individual and very powerful piece of equipment. It was a hybrid microphone preamp that used DSP, digital signal processing, alongside an analog microphone preamp to allow you to choose between up to 40 different classic microphone preamps. 
We've got a selection of some of the uh, old things that we have here. And this is exactly the sort of thing that Liquid Channel could emulate. Now, the Liquid Channel had a very clever analog front end or uh, microphone preamp. Because although you could use the DSP, digital signal processing, to choose, for example, I don't know, a Pultec microphone preamp, the actual analog microphone preamp was based around switches inside. And when you chose the Pultec microphone pre, the switches would change position to match or match as closely as possible the um, the impedance of the original microphone preamp to give it a very true sound. This was produced up until last year and really is the um, a, a bit of a pinnacle of Focusrite product engineering. So let's look at the current range of products that we have now. And this <coughs> we have still got the ISA products. We now have the Scarlet products and the Sapphire products. And this is what we'll, we'll discuss and talk about now. The whole reason for me to describe this very beginning of Focusrite is really to outline how we've made, gone from making half a million pounds worth of recording consoles to something like this, which is a 99 euro audio interface. The really nice thing about all Focusrite products is that the quality is exceptionally high. Okay, in here we have a very fine microphone preamp. Okay, it's not an ISA or a liquid channel microphone preamp in here, but this is 99 euros. <laughs> and this still sounds fantastic. So the range of the uh, the range of products that we have, oh, yep, sorry, we, we also have these products as well, the iTrack, which now are products for um, iPads. We have the Forte, which is our premium USB interface. And then we also have the very powerful RedNet system, which is audio based across Ethernet connection. Let's just look at the ISA. Now, I don't have ISA products here today, but I just want to talk a little bit about how the design has been made here. It's all based around this thing. This is called the Lundahl 1538 Microphone Input Transformer. And this is a transformer that Rupert Neve handpicked to be the best possible for that microphone preamp. So the Lundahl 1538 is the key to that Focusrite sound. It also has a very specific type of uh, circuit design as well to produce a very high quality microphone preamp. The other really nice thing about the ISA um, products is that we have very fine analog to digital conversion in them as well. So this gives us an outstanding open-ended and transparent sound with a subtle warmth from the core saturation. Essentially, it's the focus right sound. It's still very open-ended, very airy, very light and open, but there is a very nice subtle warmth to that sound. And it's the choice of a lot of professionals here today. So here's the current range. And we have the ISA 1, the 430, the ISA 428, and the ISA 828. They're all the same microphone preamp, but we just have more microphone preamps. <laughs> okay. ISA 1. Oh, yes, the ISA 2 as well, which is a stereo mic pre. And then again, I'll quickly move into this section, which is the ADCs, analog to digital conversion cards. And again, these are exceptionally high quality. We can achieve large dynamic ranges of 122 dB directly from these analog to digital conversion cards. Okay, so that's the ISA, and now we have the Scarlet range. Now, we have over on the demonstration set up here, the Scarlet 2i2 audio interface. The Scarlet 2i2 is currently 
the best-selling audio interface in the world. As I said before, this isn't an ISA audio, uh, uh, ISA microphone preamp, but we have got the same engineers who work on the ISA product designing these interfaces as well. And in terms of value for money and quality of sound, the uh, Scarlet interfaces are really at the height of their game. So, the Scarlet 2i2 gives you two inputs and two outputs. And of course, that's very useful if you're going to do basic recording. Um, but then we extend the range through to different products, including the Scarlet 2i4. Now, I have the 2i4 here. And the 2i4 uses the same microphone preamps as the 2i2, but this time it's two inputs and four outputs. So on the back, we double the amount of outputs available. This is obviously very useful if we're a performing musician and we need to set up separate headphone or cue mixes because we can use outputs three and four to feed the signal directly to the uh, headphone mix. So we can choose outputs one and two or outputs three and four. Now across the Scarlet, we also have this little thing called the Halo. And this is a little LED light that is behind the gain control that allows you to make sure you get a good quality signal as you're recording. So the game or the Halo game ring is really a very powerful tool to let you see what your signal is doing. <coughs> if you're getting a green signal, it's going to be a good signal. If you're getting a red signal, it's going to be distorting. Now, the Scarlet 2i2 and the 2i4 and the 18i8, the 18i20, all of these products, except this one, which I'll move to one side, but all of these products share exactly the same microphone preamps. This means that you can buy a Scarlet Solo at 99 euros, and you're still getting the same high quality microphone preamp for recording as you would if you'd bought the 18i20. It's just in the 18i20, of course, we have even more connections. So, the two main ranges are the Scarlet's and also the Sapphire's. And here we have one of the very latest of the Sapphires. This is the Pro 26. Now the key difference between Scarlet's and Sapphires is that Scarlet's connect to your computer using a standard USB connection. The Sapphires connect using a Firewire connection. Now some people question why we would still produce a Firewire interface when it's very difficult to now buy a computer, a brand new computer, that has a Firewire connection on there. And the great thing about all our Firewire interfaces are that they are completely compatible with Thunderbolt. So if you have an older Mac with Firewire, you have a Firewire connection for the interface. If you have a newer computer, like this one, I can use a Firewire to Thunderbolt adapter cable to connect it directly into the computer and it behaves in exactly the same way as if it was connected to a Firewire connection. So there is no problem at all with Firewire still being produced because it's both Firewire and Thunderbolt which is very useful. If you're an existing customer that has Firewire but you want to upgrade your computer you can do so and be completely sure that your Firewire interface, your Focusrite Firewire interface, is going to be perfectly compatible with it. So the Pro 26, the new model, shall I just turn it off for a second and unplug it? This is sort of, it's, it's sort of portable, <laughs> but it's a little bigger than the usual. And that's because we've got a number of new features on there. So we have four microphone preamps available on the back of this unit. We also give you uh, eight outputs on the back as well. Sorry, six outputs and a pair of line-ins as well. 
So we have potentially six inputs and six outputs that are analog. We also have digital SP diff or Sony Oh, I Sony Panasonic Digital Interface Link, mm -hmm. or Pioneer, anyway, it's the Sony um, SB diff, <laughs> yeah, digital connection, which is a stereo connection. But alongside that, there is also an optical input. So this means we can add additional microphone preamps in to the interface by connecting with a digital connection here. So in total, this unit can take a further eight, so let's count them off. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, plus eight, 14, uh, plus the stereo, which is uh, <laughs> 16, <laughs> plus a thing called loopback, which is a way of folding signals back into itself. This box can take 18 inputs in total. Now, another advantage I would say to Firewire over USB is if you look at my system here, I've got so many USB devices connected onto my computer. I have the brand new audio hub from Novation, which I will be talking about, but I also have this camera, I've got my launch pads and base stations all connected into my computer, into the universal serial bus. Presently, well, but this is unplugged, so at, at the moment, I have nothing plugged into my Firewire connection or Thunderbolt connection. Now, audio is the most important aspect of your recording. If halfway through a recording, the audio breaks or stops working or what have you, then basically you've lost that information. You can't retrieve that information. So, if you have a dedicated port that you can use on your computer to get audio in and out of the computer, my recommendation is to always use that. At the moment, most people don't use a Firewire connection or a Thunderbolt connection very much on their Mac. So if you have this type of connection available to you, use that for your audio. It means it's not sharing a path into and out of the computer with other devices and other data. <clears throat> so if you are looking at getting an interface that you know is 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 let's say um, is going to be more uh, robust, more um, not more stable. It's not fair on the USB interfaces. They all very much work. But if audio is the important aspect and you have a dedicated connection for it, use that connection. Also with Firewire, it's, it's, it's good to know that Firewire and Thunderbolt has a controller chip built into the computer. USB controller is done by the software on the computer. So once again, you have a dedicated controller chip for your audio interface. Okay, so this is a bit about um, the Sapphire um, and the, uh, the importance of Firewire. With the Sapphire range we have a number of different units, including the Pro 40, which is the same as the 18i20. This will give you uh, 20 inputs and 20 outputs. The Liquid Sapphire 56 also gives you up to 24 channels of audio in through a single Firewire connection, but includes as well the liquid preamps, which are the software brothers and sisters, if you like, of the original liquid channel. So the full Sapphire range is still being produced alongside the Scarlet's. And once again, the Scarlet Solo here, with its microphone preamp, it's the same microphone preamp as you'll find in the Pro 26 or as in most of the preamps on the Liquid Sapphire 56, except the Liquid Pre channels. So it, they do make very, very good options for, um, uh, for your audio interface. 
this is my little section on, fi on the Firewire and Thunderbolt. Audio is the critical data. It's very important data, it's critical stuff. And if that messes up, then that can be a problem. So, okay. Now, on the larger interfaces, we also have a thing called mix control. Now, I'm going to actually demonstrate this now, because I think this is very useful to see. So, if my interface is on, yep. Okay, I can close the PowerPoint, and we can actually start to look at some stuff now. Now, um, Sapphire mix control. Okay, so this is the Sapphire Mix Control. I'll just close everything else off so it's not confusing. And this is the software controller for the larger audio interfaces. And this itself is a very powerful little system. What we do, what we've got here is access to our different outputs. So here I'm looking at the Pro 26. And I have monitor output 1 and monitor output 2. I can choose what I send to that output. So if I want to physically connect my output from my DAW software, I can physically connect that to one of the outputs. Now this means it's very easy to set up sub-mixes or headphones using the mix control software. So for example, I'm sitting in my recording studio I have my uh, KRKs facing me and um, basically I can choose for my output from my software to feed directly to the KRKs. But here I have line output 3 and 4 and you can see a little headphone icon there and that is basically headphone output, hang on where is it, headphone output 1 here. And so here I could choose to say, you know, let's take door three and door four to the headphone feed here. Within my software, I can set up a submix for the performers or for the headphone mix using outputs three and four within the software and send it directly to here. I also have the option of choosing a mix as well. And a mix is made up of what we have up at the top here. We have the mixer section up at the very top. And here I can choose what I want to be sent through that mix. So I could take dedicated outputs from my DAW software and a mixture of inputs and feed that directly to one of the line outputs. So again, I can actually create a submix like so. So just very quickly to demonstrate, I can create a quick submix here of mix one and send that to my headphone output very quickly. I have a second headphone output on this unit as well. And so if I wanted to, I could take mix three and set this up and then send this to the second headphone output. So using the mix control can really open up a lot more power inside this interface alongside the high quality microphone preamps and high quality conversion that we have inside the uh, interface. Okay, so that's the mix control. We'll have a very quick look at the Scarlet Solo now. This is one of the very new products from Focusrite. The Scarlet 2i2, as I say, is currently the world's best-selling audio interface. The Scarlet 2i2 is very good value for money. Two Focusrite microphone preamps, high-quality converters, um, dedicated headphone output, direct monitor switch, phantom power, the usual things. One thing at Focusrite that we have not had is an interface below the 2i2 price point. There have been alternatives for people. Um, you know, there are other companies that have produced $99, uh, 99 euro um, audio interfaces, but we haven't. So the Scarlet Solo is really now a great choice for that customer because 
We have focus right quality sound, but at a nice affordable price point. On the Scarlet Solo, it's very straightforward. Microphone preamp, guitar, or line input. So, a single microphone and a single instrument or line in. Phantom power as well, and monitor control, which also controls the headphone output volume. We'll also have a direct monitor switch, so we can give zero latency monitoring directly through the unit. And on the back, very straightforward, USB connection and a pair of Phono or RCA connections for your output. And a Kensington lock if you need to keep it safe and secure. So it's very straightforward and easy to understand as a product. It is two inputs and two outputs, but a single microphone preamp and a single guitar or line input. And is 99 euros. There's not a great deal much more to say about that. In fact, with Focusrite, it's quite difficult to make these things seem very sexy. <laughs> Essentially, these are boxes with holes in them. <laughs> and that's it. Oddly enough, the more you pay, the more holes you get. <laughs> so the less, the less, there's more air inside it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that is the Scarlet Solo. Now I also have with me a, a, a brand new product from Focusrite. Again, this is the very first time this has been seen outside of the UK, and this is the iTrack Pocket. Now the iTrack Pocket is a different direction for Focusrite, in that it's now a dedicated product for an iPhone. Presently, <clears throat> There are so many people recording themselves and placing their recordings on YouTube. It's a really big area. One of the problems is for doing that sort of recording is that if you use the microphones on your iPhone, they're not that great, you know? They're fine for pe talking to people on the phone, but for making music recordings, really, they don't cut, cut, cut it. So we've developed the iTrack Pocket to be the solution for the video, the YouTube generation, if you like. It's an iPhone 5, 5S or 6 product and connects to your iPhone using the Lightning connection, the new connection type from Apple. And it just simply plugs in, like so, and then you pop it into the stand and that's it. Very simple, very straightforward. Firstly, it's a very nice stand. It works very well, I've tested this, it works very well on my office desk for Skype calls and FaceTime calls, so that's quite nice. Um, but it also is very good at the recording side of things. Now, we've developed an app for the iPhone. You may need to gather round to see this work, but please feel free. Okay. This app that we've created, oh, <laughs> I managed to take a picture of you all there, well done. <laughs> this app is called Impact. It's a free app from Focusrite and really opens up the power, I would say, of the iTrack Pocket. So we open up Impact and here we are. Now you can see here we've got a record button. Very simple. We just hit the record button. Once we've done this, I don't know if you can see, but at the bottom we have a waveform that scrolls past. This turns red to tell us we're recording. When we're happy, we press the stop button, it's captured it. So it's very simple to use, like the camera function on an iPhone. But there are some very nice features on here. High quality stereo microphones, but also a guitar input on the side. So a dedicated instrument input on the side. On this side, I have a gain control for the input volume. On the app, we also have a number of nice things. So, if I push the guitar icon, okay, a bit difficult to demonstrate it from, from this angle, but... <laughs> so now, in this page, I can choose to just use the stereo mic on the iTrack Pocket, or I can choose to use the guitar input and the stereo mic. 
so I can plug in an electric guitar and still use the microphone for vocals. Or I can choose to just go to guitar. This is now just listening to the input on the side. <clears throat> now if you plug a guitar into this input, we also give you a Fender Twin amp simulator <laughs> with reverb, <laughs> reverb and, and drive. I like the way everybody's laughing, this is good. <laughs> we also have a Marshall emulation <laughs> and a Vox AC30 as well. So a choice of different electric guitar amps. So if you do want to, and I, I must admit, I have an AC30, that is my guitar amp, this AC30 sounds brilliant. Now, my AC30 is, is over 30 kilograms. This <laughs> just fits in my pocket. It's very nice. If I wanted to use this, perhaps for playing live, I can also turn on the output from my headphone output on the phone. So I can now take that signal and feed that into a speaker or PA. So you could use this as a guitar amp simulator program, if you wanted to. <laughs> okay, so this is the guitar page here. And as I say, you select your input, and you can select if you want to, the guitar amp, or you can keep it clean if you prefer. Okay, now, as I mentioned, to record is very easy. So you just hit record, this turns red, and we're picking up signal from the front, then we press stop, it's captured it, it's done. If I go to my little folder option here, so, come on, there we are, there we are, look at you all, looking very beautiful, very, very handsome there, and obviously you can hit play. This turns red, and we're picking up signal from the front. Okay. <laughs> Now, we have two options here. I can go to this section, which will allow me to, what we call, crop the video. If I can make it work. Yep, there we go. Just one second. It is difficult to demonstrate it from behind, but we can shorten the length of the clip, and so on. And if I press save now, that will say, do you want to trim the original, or do you want to save that as a new version? So we'll trim the original. That's it. I also, if I go to the effects button here, I can choose now a selection of mastering effects. So compression, reverb, and enhance, which is a bit like an EQ. It's designed to be very, very easy. It's designed to be super easy for people to use and not have to sit in front of a Focusrite Forte console and twiddle all the knobs. So we have a number of different mastering options there as well. When I'm happy with that, I press select. We've added that. Now, this is probably won't work because I think in the basement here, it's difficult to get a, a 3G sort of signal. And I think I've turned it onto airplane mode, which will make it not work. But if I just press the send button, now I'm given the options available to me. So I can send this video as a message, as a mail. If I had a 3G connection, the YouTube icon would be on there. I can just simply tap that and it will instantly upload it to my YouTube site. In fact, let me just turn airport, airplane mode off and see if we can get some uh, settings, airplane mode. Let's see. Searching. It's still searching. Yeah, no, I'm not getting any, any 3G. But if we went upstairs and found 3G, YouTube would appear there. And it is so very quick and easy to work with. The quality is very good as well. Um, it's really about giving people a nice, high-quality microphone connection for their iPhone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the iTrack Pocket. <coughs> Of course, it will work with all of the other apps as well. I've, I've demonstrated it here with the Impact app, which is the free app from, no, uh, from Focusrite. But if you want to uh, use it, for example, with Voice Recorder or... I don't know, can you get GarageBand on the uh, phone? I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, yes. If, yes. Yeah, OK. So if you have uh, some sort of, um, you know, any video, uh, any video recording program, anything that uses the microphone, when this is plugged in, 
this will be the microphone. So again, this is, I think, 99 euros, I think, for this particular product. Okay. So that's the iTrack pocket, which is dedicated for the phone. And finally, on Focusrite, this is before we start making flashing lights and sounds and buttons and that sort of thing. I'll talk to you about the iTrack dock. Now I'm going to unplug it, which doesn't really matter too much. This is the iTrack dock. More and more people are creating music on their iPads now. It's become a big thing for people. And the iTrack dock is a game for any lightning connection iPad. Now I say any lightning connection. This is an iPad mini. And of course the iPad mini is a lot smaller than the iPad Air, the Retina. So what we've done is we have this lightning connection and we've put it into a movable positioning. So this will allow me now to plug into, in fact you can see just about it says iPad Air. If you have one of the older, connect, uh, older iPads, the iPad 3 or 4 I think it was, yeah. we can move up to there. We can take this pad off, this spacer, if you like this thing that will hold it, we can take that off and move this up and it will fit that iPad as well. So it really genuinely is for all lightning connection iPads. Now, let's just see what we have. And again, it's a box with holes in it. <laughs> it's just a very nicely designed box because of course this makes a very nice workstation area. One of the really nice things about the iTrack dock is that we have our controls on the top panel. Um, on other alternatives that are available for the iPad, the controls are often around the back or on the side, which means it's very awkward to change gains and control the levels. Here, it's all directly under your fingertips. So we have a big control for volume, independent headphone volume control, and our two gain controls, again with the halo on there so that we can tell when we've got a high level signal or a good quality signal. On the side here, we have a headphone output. Again, you know, we've got our independent headphone control. And then on the back, uh, we can see the connection types that we have. So we have got two microphone preamps. Again, high quality Focusrite mic pre's that you would find across the Scarlet and Sapphire range. Two line inputs as well. Phantom power for both of the microphone preamps and a dedicated instrument input. So again for plugging an electric guitar or an electric bass directly in, a bit like a DI. Here we have balanced outputs as well. And this, which I think is very, very useful, this is USB <coughs> MIDI. If you have a class compliant, a true class compliant MIDI controller keyboard, you can plug this in here and it will work with the iPad. Also, if, I mean, for example, I sometimes use a piece of software called Lima, which is a control surface application that you can send control data out of the iPad with. If you use a USB to standard MIDI connection lead, you can plug this in here and send MIDI data out of the iPad as well. So that's a very nice solution for controlling the iPad with MIDI and using the iPad as a MIDI controller. Of course this thing, well, I have it plugged in. This is not going to work at the minute because I don't have my power supply plugged in. The iTrack dock does need its power supply plugged in, but of course the nice thing about that is it will charge the iPad as well. So it's a great interface but it's also a very nice docking station for your iPad, which charges it as well. So that is the iTrack dock. Now, I think I've kind of finished for the Focusrite side of things for now. Um, we're gonna start looking at the, um, the, uh, the, the Novation uh, products that we have with us. Um, before I move some of the products out of the way, 
Does anybody have any questions they want to ask me about focus right at the minute? <laughs> Maybe I'm just curious. So yes. nowadays, uh, uh, which branch of gear is more affordable for the focus right? Is for home recording, home studios, or this PA or professional audio products? Okay. So what is more? What are we concentrating on as a company? Yeah. And what yeah. is more affordable for the focus right? Yeah. Which uh, which branch is getting more profits? Easily, the um, the home recording. Easily. Mm -hmm. Um, whether that's a good thing or not, I think it is a good thing. I think it's a very liberating thing for everybody because for the price of, this is not good for recording studios of course, <laughs> what I'm about to say, but for the price of one day in a recording studio, you can buy an interface for life that will give you the ability to record at home. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a computer, and you buy an audio interface. I should say, obviously, all of the audio interfaces, all Focusrite and Novation products come with software as well. They come with a copy of Ableton Live. Uh, they come with a whole load of samples and virtual instruments. So you buy the one product, the Scarlett 2i2 or Scarlett Solo. If you have a computer, you well, you shouldn't buy an interface if you don't have a computer. <laughs> but you've got everything there to be able to record yourself. Um, so in terms of what is the most successful aspect of the business, I have no problem in saying at all that it's definitely the home recording. Um, that is the biggest audience for buying or purchasing these products. Um, it's still growing. Recording studios are not growing as much as they were. In fact, back in 1989, Focusrite came out of the, uh, the large console market because people were not buying large consoles at that time. I'm sure that if it, people continued to buy, or studios continued to buy large-scale consoles, we'd still be making them, but we don't. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, I don't know the actual figures, but for example, the Scarlett 2i2, you know, for us to be able to say, the world's best-selling interface, which, you know, from all the sales tracking data there is, that's, you know, it is the Scarlett 2i2, that's a lot of products, it's a lot of numbers, um, and so is, yeah, certainly the most profitable aspect. And I think this um, shows as well kind of a quite a clever approach from Focusrite to business. Sure, we make great products that people love to use, and you know some people genuinely love these products. Um, but it's finding where the market is going. We don't dictate to the market. We find out just where things are going to go it. and fo follow it, yeah. but at just the right time with just the right products. Um, but yeah, I don't know how. If the comparison would be how many ISA versus uh, uh, two I2s <laughs> we would sell, I don't know what that number would be, but we sell a lot more of, of the Scarlet interfaces. Um, so yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. No problem. Does anybody have any more questions? No? Good. I've explained everything.